Hello, everyone. This is Bill Griffin. Welcome to Different Tech Podcast. If you like this comment content, please subscribe, like, share, comment. And uh, new episodes Tuesdays and Thursdays. And today I'm uh, talking with uh, Dalen Lowry, who is a Republican candidate for Georgia State House District 96. She is 25 years old, is a uh, owner of a fully promoted Swanee, which is they market a variety of promotional products. And Dalen is a 20 year resident of Gwinnett County. Is there anything I should add? Uh, no, I think you're doing great. I mean, I would just add, I've um, been a not only a Gwinnett resident, but also a Duluth resident for 20 years. I grew up here. I went to Duluth Middle School, Duluth High School. And so I'm very entrenched in this district and ready to serve and represent the people. Tell tell us what, what a little bit about your district. Sure. So my district encompasses the cities of Duluth and Norcross. So it's kind of, um, if you were to look on a map, it's the bottom part of Duluth and kind of the top part of Norcross. So essentially it is the Buford Highway over to um, 85 and then also 120 down to Jimmy Carter. And there's a few cutouts there, things that are not included, things that are included outside of those lines, but that's the gist of the area. So I could ask a, a few questions here. Are you... Uh... Are you in favor of the concept of school choice, uh, K through 12? Yes, absolutely. I think um, school choice is an important matter, not only for students, but also for parents. Parents pay a lot of money to make sure that their kids are getting a good education, even in public schools. And so if we can make sure that those students are going to schools that are not only going to increase their education level, but also their potential for a good future, that's what has to come first and foremost. But on a secondary level, we have to make sure that schools that are failing understand that there are consequences for failing. And if that means losing students, losing funding, then that's what we need to do because we have to encourage our schools to be top tier schools. What is the reason for the, any resistance to this as best you can tell? Sure. So some of the resistance that I've heard both within the community, within the political spectrum, is that we can't be taking money away from failing schools who need the money. And sure, I get the sentiment behind that. We don't want to make a failing school fail more. Obviously we want failing schools to become successful schools, but if there's no consequences for failing, what is the incentive to become better? And why should we punish students who are forced into those failing schools just because of where they live to stay in failing schools when there's other options there? And that shouldn't be dependent just on being able to do homeschooling or being able to go to a private school. You should be able to go to another public school if you wanted to, if you have, if your family has the wherewithal to make that happen. And so giving the choice to parents and to students is huge in making sure that they get the academic resources that they need to succeed, not only K through 12, but going on to trade schools, going on to college, going on to whatever they're willing to do with their lives. I don't understand about that counter argument is if, for example, it costs, the, the, the government collects $10,000 to educate an average, the average student and you're, you're allowing parents to take a voucher for $6,000, let's say. The county's to the good $4,000. Uh, we didn't talk about an amount, but, um, if this were to pass, what would that what would that ratio look like? Do you think? And and um, I guess I'm asking two questions. What? Why? I don't understand the counter argument that sure. we're sucking money out of the schools if you're not actually giving the or allowing the parent to the full yeah, amount of the what it would absolutely. cost to so educate believe, the child. I believe a lot of the problem comes in is that people don't understand what this would actually do, what school choice actually looks like. And then it's not every bit of the funding for that student is going with the student, only part of it is. It's a voucher system or part of the money is going. Um, and so the misinformation there makes people really leery about accepting school choice as a good option because they believe, thanks to media, thanks to um, what's being put out in social media, that kind of thing, that all of the money for that child goes with them. When that's not really the case. And 
I wouldn't quote me on these numbers, but I believe it's $12,000 a student and it's a $6,000 voucher. So schools are actually still getting $6,000, but no student. So that's $6,000 and one less person to have to educate that so they can put that $6,000 or whatever the actual amount is towards other students, towards other improvements, whatever they may need. And so in a lot of ways, it's actually helpful for the, fam for the family school itself to still get that money, but not have that extra kid to educate. And that's just not being presented to the public the way that it should be. And so I think that's where a lot of the pushback is coming from. Yes, that uh, explains it uh, uh, much better than my question uh, was uh, kind of botched it. Uh, what is the, uh, I'm I sort of play devil's advocate here. Maybe uh, this gets through. And then you, people turn around and say, okay, well, college, should, we should do the same thing with college. What do you, do you see? Does that make any sense? What do you think of that notion? I would say no, only because we already offer so many options as far as college goes. We have tons of trade schools or community colleges in this state that are very affordable that are an option. We also, if you work hard, you can get Hope, you can get Zell Miller. Those are still options that pay for, if not all, then a very good portion of your schooling. And so it's all about how hard are you willing to work to be able to earn what the state is already giving out. And so I don't think that there's really a reason to offer vouchers or, or programs like that at a collegiate level because there's already programs in place. What do you think the big issues are that the next uh, legis that needs to be accomplished in the next uh, legislative session? Sure. So um, obviously I'm not part of leadership. I'm not even elected yet. So I would not be able to be part of setting what are the goals of the Republicans in the state house going forward for the next year. But I think some of the things that we're going to have to address um, are taxes and, and a budget. That's a huge one that we're going to have to work on. Obviously going into a situation where we see the record high inflation rates, we're seeing people not being able to afford gas, afford groceries, afford childcare. We've got to do something to kind of counterbalance that, at least where we can. We're obviously heading, if not already into a recession towards that, that peak, and we don't want to get there, but I think we're probably going to within the next few months. And so at a state level, we have to make sure that we are wisely spending taxpayer dollars and where we can cutting the taxes that we are having to take from people. That's their hard earned money that goes towards these gas bills, these grocery bills, childcare bills, um, rent and mortgage. And so that's going to be probably the number one, in my opinion. And then also looking forward, obviously with what's happened in, in recent months, we're going to be dealing with gun control issues. Um, that's going to, without fail, that's going to come up. And then also school choice, like we were just discussing. I think that's going to be a huge situation that we continue to deal with, um, regardless of who gets elected in November. What do you think the the current, the, what do you think the ideal rate would be? The current rate for individual the marginal, uh, the highest marginal tax rate for an individual is the same as the corporate rate, which is 5.75. What a percent, what would you, what would be your ideal number? I mean, obviously I'd always love to lower it. Um, I think even if you just go half a percentage point, that makes a difference overall. And so anytime that we can lower it, even just a little bit, that matters. But more than trying to lower the tax rate, I think it's more important that we look at what are we spending these taxes on and how can we allocate these funds to make the most use of it for the population, rather than wasting, wasting funds on things that are no longer useful or on programs that are not doing what they're, they're planned to do. Or there are so many um, issues where we're spending large sums of money on programs or on policy that isn't helpful to the people who are paying for it. And so I think people are gonna be a lot more willing and understanding of paying the taxes they're currently paying, although we want to lower it, um, if they know that their funds are being spent wisely and not wasted. Because it's very, as a taxpayer, it's very frustrating when I see things happening and it's, I know that's my taxpayer dollars, but I see it being wasted. I mean, a, a great example, just down the road from my home, they've done some reconstruction on a bridge. And 
because of how they've done it, there is a requirement that they build a sidewalk. The amount of time and money that I'm seeing being spent on building the sidewalk that goes from the bridge a fourth of a mile and then just ends is ridiculous. There are things like that that you see all over the place and things we don't see where we can make adjustments at the state level so we're not wasting people's money. I ask the same question of Democrats. Do you view climate change as an existential threat? And what should the state, if you do, what should the state be doing about it? Sure. Um, I do not believe it is an existential crisis that we're in. I think it's something that we need to address and we need to be looking at and researching ways to improve how we live our lives to increase the longevity of our planet. But I don't believe it's the existential crisis that it's made out to be. I think. What, what do you understand that term to mean? Because it could mean uh, uh, if you asked 100 people to define the term, they probably, you probably get 100 different definitions, right? Sure. Yeah, I mean, for me, it is not that impending doom situation that, that we're made to believe that it is. Um, so I, I really wouldn't even consider it a crisis at all at this point. I think that obviously we're starting to see some issues, but our, our planet has a life cycle. We, we have heat and we have ice and we have those things come and go. And so I don't think that that's the best way of looking at what's happening to our planet. I think more realistically, we can sit here and say, okay, we know that fossil fuels are not the best thing that we can be doing. Let's, let's put some effort into researching what can be done instead. So that can't be through mandates, that can't be through um, forcing people to use different products. It has to be, let's put the research together and let's show where it not only makes sense ecologically, but it also makes sense fiscally because we have to do things fiscally responsible as well. When you say impending doom, doom, um, I'm assuming you mean to to mankind. Yes, I mean I will say a lot of people um, who are proponents of this theory that our planet is dying think that within my lifetime or the generation behind me's lifetime, our planet will implode or will no longer exist. And I just don't think that that's factual representation of where we are. There's also um, uh, the thing that I find interesting about this is that those same people, you would think they would want gas prices as high as possible uh, because that slows, I mean, that's going to be, that's going to be a big disincentive to right. use fossil fuels. And right. so when you talk to, I guess my question is, when you talk to constituents, are they, do they, are they savvy to this? Is, in other words, um, the folks that say, oh, I, high gas prices is a bad thing, but five years ago, you said the world's going to end if we don't, in X amount of time, if we don't get rid of fossil fuels. So the two right. things are very contradictory. I guess, is there, are you constituents? Um, no, I really haven't heard that. And I think a lot of the times this idea of this environmental crisis, that is not what everyday people are thinking. That is not what your, your average American citizen is worried about. They're worried genuinely about how are they going to afford to get to work? How are they going to afford to get their children to school? And so that's a much bigger issue than this so-called environmental crisis. And I also don't think that most people, at least not people I've been speaking to in, in this district, are believers of our planet's gonna die and we have to save the environment right now. Um, I think most of them are a little bit more, I won't say down to earth, but realistic about the, the, the immediate concern is how do we afford to live? Just speaking for myself, I'm a bit skeptical of the same people that tell me Climate change is an existential threat, but I really want to see lower gas prices. You, the two things don't make sense to me. So, correct, correct. There's, I think that unfortunately in our political landscape today, we're seeing a lot of that where one person can have two very diverging ideas and don't see how they don't fit together. Um, relating, relating everything back to these things interlock and matter together doesn't seem to be as important as it used to be. Do you support any changes in the 
in Georgia laws regarding abortions? Um, just to clarify, do you mean changes with the current six The current state law. Sure. So I would be open to changes to that. I think that there are um, some problems with the heartbeat bill that I think we could correct. And I understand and very much appreciate the hard work that went into that bill. I think that's going to save a lot of unborn lives. Um, I'm a huge proponent of life. And I think that we need to do what we can to save unborn babies. That's first and foremost. But I also think that there are realities. Um, reality doesn't always match up with what we want. And so I think maybe looking at an eight to 10 week is more realistic because people bring up, when they bring up the point of, well, you may not always know at six weeks. That's very true. I mean, a lot of women don't know at six weeks. And if they do, they know between four and six weeks. And that can be a very challenging decision to make in a very short time frame. And while abortion is not something I want to support, there are always cases. It is never a black and white issue. There are always cases that we have to take into consideration. And so I think being a little bit more amendable to that it is a good idea because we want to be compassionate. We want to be loving of everyone, including women who have abortions. I think that's one of the biggest mistakes that we as, as Republicans, as Christians have made is we have rather intentionally or unintentionally vilified women who get abortions rather than loving them. And so I think that's where we can kind of take a step back and say, okay, we would love to not have any abortions at all, but this is the loving thing to do to try to protect as many lives as we can. There's uh, also the there's the political reality that right. you don't always get everything you want. Um, Absolutely. During the, so the the state was very involved in the lockdown, the COVID lockdowns. Do you think that? Well, let, let me ask this: Are you aware of a quantifiable benefit? that the lockdowns had that could be explained to the citizens? Did, are they well, owed that explanation? Let's put it that way. Um, I, I don't know that we're necessarily owed an explanation to that. I think that sometimes, um, Kemp, for example, there were things that he had to do in order to make sure that people were safe when we didn't understand what was happening. Um, Corona was a new, new virus. Um, and sometimes when you don't have all the facts, you, you have to react in a certain way. And I think he did the best he could in that situation. Um, I also think he did the best he could by having us be the first state to reopen because we did have more facts coming in. We did understand a little bit better. And I think we could operate in a safe way without being closed. And so, um, well, I don't necessarily agree that shutting down the, the state was the best idea. I think he operated the best he could under the facts he had at the time. And I think that's all we can ever ask of our, of our government. Interesting. So we may, not, we may, uh, I've heard world renowned health experts in this field uh, claim that we may never know whether or not there was a benefit but right. on the opposite end, I've also heard politicians claim that there was absolutely a loss of life. We, we, there were, more lives would have been lost had there not been a shutdown. Right. And when you ask to quantify this, there's, there's never an answer. It seems to me in order to, because this is done on the state level, this is done, done mm -hmm. on the national level, and a lot of people forget this uh, happened in our in our county, the Gwinnett County Commission level, and in order to make <laughs> the correct decision for the next pandemic, you know, you might right. you you really need to know what that what happened in the last one. I think, uh, and I don't hear anybody in politics or state government talking about that. Yeah, I would agree with you there. I, I haven't heard much talk about that either. And I can definitely see where having factual information about what's happened in the past can inform how we make decisions in the future. And 
unfortunately, I'm, I'm kind of in agreement with some of those experts that you were discussing. We may never know. I, and I think at this point, it's going to be hard to go back and say, this was the loss of life in what we did do versus what would have been the loss of life had we done something different um, because we didn't do something different. And so I think that's kind of hard to quantify that. But the argument that I have heard is it doesn't matter if we saved one life, we did the right thing. And th there can be arguments made for that and arguments made against that because uh, uh, on the same token, people who were forced out of business lost their livelihood are in a worse situation financially and physically now than they would have been had they been allowed to stay open and operate under safe operating procedures. And so th there's two sides to every situation like this. And we as a society going forward are gonna have to decide what do we prefer? And I think that's gonna come down to a state issue because what we prefer in Georgia is likely not what was going to be preferred in California or New York. There's uh, this law in uh, Florida, this subject, do you think that the subject of sexual orientation should be discussed K through three? No, absolutely not. I don't think any any sexual orientation or any sexual anything should be discussed at, at that age. Um, children that young don't need to worry about that. They're kids, and we just need to let them be kids. Who should decide that? Should that be codified at the state level to prevent to protect parents from? Um, what a county school board may say is okay? Absolutely. Uh, I think in situations like that, it is absolutely the state's job to protect children. Um, those are the most innocent among us, and it is our job and our duty to make sure that they are protected from situations like that. Um, and I'm always a big proponent of doing things at a state level rather than a federal level. Anytime we can make sure um, that rights are brought back to the state and, and not at the federal level, that's what we need to do. Is it unreasonable for citizens to believe that voting ought to be done in secrecy? Oh, boy. Um, <laughs> I have mixed emotions about that. You're not the first person to struggle with that question. I, I can understand, especially in today's political climate, why people would want their vote to be secret. Um, I, I went through several experiences in my life where my political persuasion was a problem. I was actually, um, I had to leave a previous college that I went to because I was getting death threats because of my political views, not because of who I voted for, but simply because of my views. And so the ability to cast a secret ballot in this country for those reasons is really important. On the other side of things, I'm a huge proponent of if you're ashamed of who you're voting for, you shouldn't be voting for them. That's, oh, pardon me, I didn't understand that. Sure, I'm a huge proponent of if you're ashamed of who you're voting for, you shouldn't be voting for them. I think everyone should be very proud of who they're voting for. And if you can't be proud of it, then you need to reconsider who you're voting for. Um, personally, I would never have a problem with telling everyone who I voted for in every single race because I believe in open, open honesty. And that's just my personal opinion. But we have a long history of a secret ballot in this country. And I think that given the political climate, there's good reason for that. I've got a few years on you. My original voting experience was in complete confidence. So it didn't matter. Um, I, could, uh, I could tell people who I voted for, I could be lying. There's no way to prove who I voted for. The idea of voting by mail during, during that time for everyone was unthinkable because of that reason. I've asked other candidates about voting by mail because there's no assurance of secrecy. You know, people saying, jest, well, I get vote, four votes now. Uh, yeah. Or maybe, maybe not jest. Maybe they mean it, but my, my point is there's no way, it's an unknowable thing. I, I'm speaking as a constituent when I express this concern, I wanna know what you think about it is, I don't understand why politicians are insistent upon inserting that dynamic into people's lives where uh, people could easily seed their vote, sell their vote. Um, the idea that it's against the law and we're, it's because it's kind of a, uh, yeah, it can be, there's a lot of laws that are almost impossible to prosecute. 
Um, right. People can be intimidated for their vote or just, you know, I, I want to I, I want to watch you vote. And um, I don't understand why politicians want to put that dynamic where you can get harassed like that into people's lives. I don't I don't get it. But anyway, any rate, what's your thoughts on that? Sure. I mean, I completely agree with you. And unfortunately, I have seen an increase in the number of people who are wanting to vote by mail. And I can't understand that. I think the idea of voting and voting in person is such a special thing. And sadly, that's not a shared belief I, I feel anymore, um, especially among my, my generation. It doesn't seem like voting is looked at as this beautiful opportunity to be active in the way that our government runs. It's looked at as, oh, that's, that's no big deal. And it shouldn't be. Yeah, it, it is. It's looked at as, I can't take the time. It's not worth my time. And that's just not reality. Reality is it's important. Who you vote for makes a difference in every aspect of your life. And I just don't think that's understood anymore. But as far as politicians encouraging mail-in ballots, I think that's a terrible idea. Not only is it an issue for an anonymity, but it's also an issue for integrity of the vote. There are so many more ways for fraud to occur with mail-in ballots or drop-off ballot drop boxes than an in-person vote, whether that's early voting or day of voting. Those are the most secure forms of voting and mail-in ballots just aren't there. Um, even if you do bring your, your ballot to the drop box and drop it off, it's still, there's an anonymity issue and there's a security issue. So personally, I would love to go back to let's crack down on who can have a mail-in ballot and make sure it's people who are truly disabled, military, um, or have a valid reason for it, rather than if you want one, just ask for it. I think that's a really bad precedent that we've set. And I think we need to, to get a hold of that before it's a runaway train. Well, I mean, it's already, I mean, I think it's, I think the ship's already sailed. Um, Very until, possibly. Until uh, Democrats get on board with it. I think, I think it's already sailed because the, the law is, you can request one now in Georgia and the idea that, and that's a Republican led legislature and the world's cracking down on them. And it's actually um, uh, very less restrictive than uh, four years ago. Absolutely. Like I that. mean, there, there's still this idea, even I, I don't know if I mentioned, I'm in my master's program and even one of our textbooks spoke about Georgia being one of the most difficult states for voting rights. And that's just not true. I mean, Gwinnett County alone, we have two weeks of early voting, seven days a week for 12 hours a day, plus day of voting, plus mail-in ballots, plus mail drop boxes for ballots. There's just so many options there. And it seems like no matter what we do, it's never enough. When in reality, voting should be a sacred thing that people look forward to and are excited about. And so we shouldn't need two weeks of early voting. We shouldn't need mail-in voting for any reason for anybody. We shouldn't need these drop boxes because it should be looked at as something that is worth your time and worth your effort. It, one thing I noticed on your website is that, man, I'm sure other places, but college campuses, for example, people uh, should not um, be persecuted or discriminated against because uh, if they exercise their right to free speech. Absolutely. So I wanted to, I wanted to ask you when, when you, how do you define, do you define free speech as protected under the first amendment? All yes. protected? Yes. So for example, uh, a lot of people, I think, don't understand this, that hate speech, well, I guess you could have hate speech that is unprotected if it incites violence. That, but um, so I, I, I can tell by reading your website, you're pretty familiar with this concept. But many people do not understand that hate speech is actually protected speech. And there's... Absolutely good reason for it. So I want to see if you have any thoughts on that. Absolutely. Um, I think we have to be willing to be uncomfortable. We have to be willing to be offended. And I think the fact that we have gotten to the point where 
we tell people they can't say certain things or they can't talk about certain things because it could be looked at as oppression or it could be looked at as you're making someone uncomfortable or you're making them feel um, belittled. That's too bad. Where we've become a soft society because we don't want to have those real conversations and we're not, we're too afraid to be offended. There have been plenty of times in my life where things have offended me and I've grown from it. But now it's, you can't offend anybody. You can't say anything that's remotely offensive. Um, and I think that's where we failed because like you're saying, there is hate speech that is protected under the first amendment as it should be. Doesn't mean I have to like it. Doesn't mean I have to agree with it or that anyone else has to like it or agree with it, but it is protected for a reason. Isn't there a practical aspect of it in that who would decide what is hateful and what isn't? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that's where cancel culture has, has kind of come in and attacked that as it changes day to day. It can change from hour to hour what is acceptable and what isn't. And that's on a societal level rather than a political level. And even that's really not okay because as a society, we've gone backwards in how do we protect free speech and how do we communicate with each other? And so, especially on college campuses, and I've testified in, this, in the House and the Senate for the last couple of years about this issue, we go to college for it to be a, pl a place of higher learning, a place of higher education, where we can have different beliefs and we can have different values and we can have those honest conversations so that when you're 18 to, to 24, 25, and you're going through college, and for those who are older, but especially those formative years, it's so important to be allowed to have differing beliefs and talk about why you believe what you believe. That's where we form our belief systems and our morals and what matters to us because we're confronted with differing ideas. And if you're only confronted with one idea and one ideology and one belief system, you never have to challenge it. You're, that's indoctrination, that's not education. And until we are protecting free speech, we will always have indoctrination and not education. What are the big issues that you most agree with your opponent? Oh boy. <laughs> um, I think Pedro is a wonderful person, first of all, and I commend him for all the work that he's done in the community over the years. Um, he's been in office for about 20 years now, and that has given him a lot of opportunity to do wonderful things in the community. But politically, we disagree on pretty much everything. Um, we are very much polar opposites on every issue that I know of. Um, I think we can, the one place that we definitely both agree is we have to have budgets that are balanced and that are doing what's best for the community. Now, how we do that, we may disagree on, but the basic premise of that, we absolutely agree on. And another issue is public safety. Um, both of us are very much protective of our community and agree that that has to be an issue, not only for our district, but for our state as a whole, we have to make sure that we're protecting our communities and ensuring safety. Now, again, we may disagree on how that happens, but the basic premise is there. And I think that's always a good starting point. Um, you, and, you and I actually were at an event where, where people from different sides of the aisle were discussing different issues. And it's so important that we, not only in a political field, but in a social field, we start with where do we agree and work out from there? Because if we start with what can we agree on, even if it's just a basic principle, we can start with an understanding and then we can work out the details of how we get to that. What do you think, uh, what, what are maybe one realistic thing that both parties could agree upon? Sure, so I have um, something really particular that's a, that's a big key point for me and I think it should be an easily nonpartisan, nonpartisan idea. And that's the pink tax, which the pink tax is a sales tax on feminine care products. And many, many states across the nation have taken that up as an issue and said, we are not going to charge sales tax on items that are necessities and for women and are not an option. And Georgia has actually looked at that before, but they have not been able to pass a bill on that. And I think that's something that regardless of what side of the aisle you're on, we can see that taxing women on something that they cannot change about themselves, about the bodies that they need, doesn't make sense. Um, there was a study done several years ago that the amount of money that a woman spends in her lifetime on taxes for feminine care products 
can actually, if not completely pay for a college education, at least partially pay for a college education. And so if we can give that money back to women to have in their pockets, we can have far more educated population, more women who are able to go to college, complete college, or use it for whatever they need, whether that's for childcare or for getting certifi cert sorry, certifications in things that they want to work in. There's just a lot better things that we can do, and that shouldn't be an issue that's down party line. Is there uh, is there anything you uh, thank you for doing this uh, again? Uh, is there anything you'd like to add? You know, I really appreciate you having me on and asking these questions. These are very deep, thought provoking questions, and I think that's the conversations we need to be having. The only thing I would add is I am a first time candidate, um, and I'm running because we need choice. And as much as I respect and admire Pedro for everything that he's done for this district over the last 20 years, I always believe that people should have a choice in who they vote for, and it shouldn't just be one person that's on the ballot. So I'm here to make sure that the other side of the aisle is represented, is represented and that other ideas are represented on the ballot in November. And anyone who agrees with me, I would encourage them just to reach out to me. Um, my phone number is available on my website. You can always reach out to me that way. And I'm more than happy to speak with anyone and get to know you and um, try to help with any issues that come up. What is, uh, how do people find you? And you might want to spell sure. your website out. Yes, absolutely. So one way you can find me is on Facebook. I am actually very um, active on Facebook. So that's an easy way to do it. And also my phone number, which is 770-710-1894. Um, and then also, like you said, my website, that would be, make sure it is www.dalenlowry.com. And that's D-A-E-L-E-N-L-O-W-R-Y.com. Very good, very good. Well, I have a uh, Dalen Lowry. She's a, uh, pardon me, whoa, whoa, Republican candidate <laughs> for... <laughs> uh, Georgia House District 96. And um, thank you again uh, for doing this. I really appreciate it. Uh, you've been watching the, listening to the Different Take podcast with Bill Griffin. I really appreciate you watching. Please uh, subscribe, like, comment, and share if you like this content. Thank you. Thank you.